salutations and welcome to Serafina Sephra Says. Today we will continue with the bumbling blunder tale of Primrose Goodwing in Chapter 6, Prima Desideratum. Well, not quite yet. I'd wait until Ember was alone before I made my big entrance, what the pocketbook called the Grand Reveal. And it would have to happen soon. Shadow smocks grew chillier the longer they were worn, and already my fingertips felt like chips of ice. I fought to keep my teeth from chattering as I followed the maid into a cramped scullery lined with shelves of pale blue china and copper and brass pots hanging from wall hooks. Hmm, my grand reveal was definitely not going to happen in here. I came to an abrupt halt as Maud rounded on Ember. Not so hoity-toity anymore, are we now? She sneered. Only at brunch and tea time, Ember said. The rest of the time, I'm strictly servile. There you go again, smarting off like you was the Queen of Lindenburg, Maud said. Maybe she would be if I had anything to do with it. You don't know your own station any more than your damn. Maud shook her fist, a hair's breadth from Ember's nose. Your mother was nothing but a suit-smudged match girl from the Greenwald before she witched Davis Shamley into wedding her. But he had everyone calling her Lady Ash, as if there was a drop of noble blood in her veins. Pots and pans rattled as the maid rummaged under a cupboard. She shoved a wooden bucket into Ember's hands. About time someone put you in your place. It's right here. Ember set the bucket upside down with a bang and sat on it. And my mother was ten times the lady next to any pampered noble cow at court. Brat, Maud chuckled as she kicked the bucket from under Ember. Your insolent cheek just cost you supper. The maid squinted at her reflection in a dented kettle as she adjusted her frilled bonnet. I want two plucked pullets and no less than twelve onions within the hour, peeled and sliced. There's a trowel waiting for you in the garden, your majesty. She gave a mocking curtsy before leaving. Ember stuck out her tongue at Maud's back. I could hardly blame her, but I decided that along with a wardrobe upgrade, Ember's manners would definitely need a little polishing before I introduced her to any princes. Still, it was all I could do to keep from shivering sparkles off my skin as I followed Ember outside. Fortune's wheel was finally swinging up instead of grinding my face in the dirt. Everything had been worth it, trading my wings, facing off with a wicked fairy and murderous marauders, just to find her, just to lose her. Ember dropped her bucket as she approached the tall briar hedge forming a barrier between the twisted garden and the untamed woods beyond. Shooting a wary glance over her shoulder, she dove into the hedge and melted through the leaves as if her skin were knit of mist. No fair! Vanishing into thin air was supposed to be my trick. I was the one wearing the shadow smock, after all. I hurried to the spot where Ember had done her vanishing act and discovered a narrow tunnel screened by a thin layer of leaves. Of course, it was only after I was halfway through that I realized the tunnel was a little too narrow for me, er, my human form, that is. Twigs scratched my face and tore my shadow smock into silk-cold tatters as I crawled to the other side of the hedge. I peered through the leaves into a half-moon meadow bordered by raspberry bushes loaded with edible jewels. Ember paced in front of the lone mulberry tree growing in the meadow's center. I'm done here. This time I mean it, she said, wringing her hands as if she meant to strangle the air. Ambrose and Etta positively cringe whenever I enter the same room, and stepmother thinks I'm a royal dunce. I flinched as she kicked a stone that narrowly missed my nose. That was close. I won't play the good little deaf mute any longer, Ember muttered. I've wasted enough years watching the Shambly legacy plundered just to catch a pair of powdered pigs with fat money bags. I can't stay, and I, she added softly, I won't be coming back. Ember was trying to justify her decisions to a tree. I was fairly certain that wasn't normal human behavior. I leaned forward when my most embarrassing mishap yet happened. A twig snapped underfoot. That's right, a twig. I could almost feel a rush of sparkles spread up phantom wings on my back. 
The twig snap was a scenario that was only supposed to happen to clomping humans, not fairy folk. Maybe my human guise was making me clumsy? All right, clumsier than usual. My thoughts scattered as the hard sole of a wooden clog hit me in the nose. I yelped and stumbled through the hole in the hedge. The last shreds of my shadow spot dissipated as I slammed into a raspberry potch. Ow! I rolled off the prickly bushes and curled in a ball on the grass. So much for my grand reveal. Why were you skulking in the hedge? Amber demanded as she slid her foot back into her clog. Did Maud pay you to spy on me? The green in her irises flamed brighter as she scowled down at me. Breathe one word about this place to Lady Eunice and I'll... I'm not a spy. I'm your fairy godmother, I squeaked. And I wasn't skulking, I added with proper indignation. I'm here to rescue you and er, make all your dreams come true. I waited for my chosen human venture to gasp in amazement, for twin tears of gratitude to slide down her cheeks. But instead, she laughed at me. Not polite laughter either, but a bursting at the seams, tears streaming down the eyes sort of laugh. <laughs> if you're my fairy godmother, then I'm a toad, she said. That can be arranged, a very ungood winged voice whispered inside me. But it's twoo, I insisted as I held my throbbing nose. So, where have you been the last 16 miserable years of my life? Ember asked as she pulled me to my feet. Her fox grin tugged at her lips. Hiding under a mushroom cap? Perhaps lost in a turnip patch? I always knew I should have weeded the garden more often. How dare she tease me? A human who didn't believe in fairy godmothers was not a scenario I'd ever envisioned. You should be grateful that I'm here at all, I said. Shaking squashed raspberries from the rumpled folds of my dress with all the dignity I could muster. Fairy godmothers are in high demand, you know. We don't help just anybody. Ember gave me a critical glance from my mud-spattered hem to my woeful tangle of red hair. I don't mean to be rude, but you don't look much like a fairy godmother to me. Oh, is that all that's bothering you? I drew my wand out and waved it dramatically over my head. A shower of opal sparkles rained over me, and within the space of a human breath, I wore an ivory ball gown with enormous puffy sleeves. My hair fell in artful ringlets down my neck, and my skin glittered with leftover motes of magic. Looks aren't everything, I said a bit smugly. Of course, Ember didn't even blink at my showy display. Let's start by restoring the Shamley almshouse, she said. Her chin jutted out stubbornly. It was my father's wedding present to my mother, but my stepmother left it to rot after a fire three winters past. I'd sooner eat my own name red hot from the hearth than let the home they built fail another day. Warmth blossomed wings inside me. The first wish a mortal makes is everything according to the pocketbook. Only the prima desideratum betrays the true nature of a human venture. Her first wish was not for herself and quite obviously revealed the royal stock of her character. But my bliss shattered as Ember's speech swerved to the gritty particulars of her wish. Make it a palace with all the modern conveniences, including indoor plumbing and, uh-oh, things were going to get thorny fast. Sorry, but I can't do that, I interrupted. Palatial enhancement spells are a rather advanced glamour, and I'm more of what you'd call a, a failure, flake queen, flake queen, and flop. Who listened to brass acorns anyway? An amateur fairy godmother, I said. I paused, wincing, as I forced out the shameful truth. My spells come undone at midnight, so anyone inside the palace would get a rude awakening every evening at 12 o'clock sharp. My admission was followed by silence, the intensely awkward kind that made my feet shift uneasily. Should have known this was too good to be true, Ember muttered. So just what can you do? She asked bluntly. My pride bristled. Lots of things. Ouch, could I sound any lamer? I cleared my throat. For example, how do you fancy a tiara? Give me a little time and I can make you a princess. Me, Ember said. Pink flushed peony petals across her cheeks. I don't think the title would suit me well at all. I'm not really one for curtsies and crowns. But 
we can talk about my shiny new future on the road out of Lindenburg. Her fox grin was back. That couldn't be good. Tonight, I plan to pay Mayor Brunaldo's stable a visit. I'm certain that I'll find my fortune much faster with a horse to take me there. No, I said. I can only help you if you stay here. I didn't even flinch at my outright lie. I couldn't afford to. If I wanted any chance of proving my right to hold a wand to the fairy court, I'd need a pocketbook perfect traditional happy ending. Somehow, I got the feeling that aspiring fairy godmother rewards fair maiden, persecuted by evil step family, would come off sounding a whole lot better than aspiring fairy godmother rewards horse thief. Stay, Ember shook her head. I'd rather choke on a boiled ferret. Stay if you like, but come midnight, I'm gone. I can help you get back your almshouse, but only if you stay here, I pleaded, growing desperate. By declaring myself her fairy godmother, Ember was now my human venture under fairy law. I had to help her to eternal felicity before I moved on to my next mortal, or I would break my contract. Only the very worst sort of fairy godmothers deserted their human ventures. This all sounds rather iffy to me, Ember said, folding her arms. Fine. But I'll only give you till the next full moon to do your, well, whatever it is you do. Most people call it magic, I said. She shrugged. Like I said, whatever. But once the month is up, I'm leaving, with or without you, fairy godmother. Ember brushed past me and ducked through the hedge. And now, a word from this week's sponsor. Is your rinky-dink core gem failing to impress potential human ventures? Try Sparkle Maximizer to increase its glitter factor. Just one spritz will magnify your wand and double its size. Side effects include unintentional self-hypnosis. And now, where were we? Oh yes. I hurried after her. You can call me Prim. I barely stumbled through the screen of leaves when Ember rounded on me. And Prim, one more thing, she said. If I have to stay here one more month, you have to help me with all the chores. Chores? I sounded the foreign word out on my tongue. It would be a snap to handle them with magic, I supposed. See this? I waved my wand under her nose. Chores aren't a problem. Splendid, Ember said, as she picked up the bucket she dropped on the grass. I'd like your wand to make the acquaintance of 12 onions in the vegetable garden. But first, her lips twitched upwards. You really should change into something more practical. You look like an explosion of goose feather down. Humph, I grumbled under my breath. Princess Scruffy was lecturing me on wardrobe choices. Still, I had to admit that it would be easier to follow her without a five-foot train trailing in my wake. Ember was already a dozen yards ahead of me. Shoving my wounded pride aside, I flicked my wand overhead and changed my garb to a peasant's brown dress and plain wooden clogs. On second thought, the clogs didn't need to be that plain. I was embellishing my clogs with ivy vines when I heard an all too familiar purr. I think I liked you better in the other gown. It made you look soft and fluffy, like me. I turned to find a sleek calico cat lounging on the statue of a flute-playing fawn. I thought you'd be halfway to Zara by now, I said, trying not to sound too pleased to see him. Calico stretched between the fawn's horns. I was, but then it dawned on me that watching you try to shove a mortal into a happily ever after scenario would be far more amusing than a lunatic sultan's court. The happiness died abruptly. He'd return for the sole purpose of being entertained by me? I don't think so. That's just too bad, I said, because there's no room for a mangy pussy in my human fable. You might as well head back to Zara. In fact, I'll help you there myself. Slashing my wand in a line through the air, I conjured a broom. I had every intention of giving Calico a hard shove in the hindquarters when a shrill voice snapped me out of my righteous indignation. Scratch the marble and I'll wring your neck, girl. Startled, I dropped the broom as I discovered Lady Eunice bearing down on me. I thought about pointing out that the fawn was a hideously inaccurate representation of the species and destroying the statue would be a favor. 
but I changed my mind after I saw the gigantic shears in her hands. Lady Eunice closed the distance between us at an alarming pace. It was all I could do not to flinch as she brandished the shears within an inch of my neck. What are you doing in my garden? She demanded between pants. I tried to speak, but found myself tongue-tied by the shears glint, sharp as a unicorn's horn and two blades. Ember skidded to a halt between us and quite literally saved my neck. Excellent. I see you've met Prim already, stepmother, she said. Mistress Webley sent her from the cottage to help with the household duties. For free, she added. Free, Lady Eunice repeated incredulously. Child, is it impossible for you to refrain from behaving like a simpleton? Ember's face stilled into a cold mask. I wondered how many years it had taken her to learn how to smooth her hurt behind it. My resolve hardened. By the next moon, I'd have Ember staring down her stepmother, preferably from a throne. You forget that nothing in this world is free, Lady Eunice admonished. She bent over a clump of marigolds and a mass of sable ruffles that all but smothered the blossom's gold faces. Dame Webley's kindness is little more than an ill-concealed attempt to force one of her worthless indigents on me. Her shears flashed with each word, and soon a forlorn pile of flower heads collected at her feet. Lady Eunice's watery gray eyes settled on me next. I sincerely hoped that she didn't regard me the same way as the marigolds. You're hungry, I expect. I nodded hesitantly. Good, Lady Eunice said, tapping me on the nose. Because you won't get a crust of bread unless you work hard. And I won't have you sleeping in the manor. The stable will do nicely. Your ladyship is a model of magnanimity, I said meekly. I was suddenly aware of a powerful temptation to prick my finger on the Ace of Jinx card and introduce her ladyship to Zenades. But I resisted, barely. Lady Eunice gave a long-suffering sigh. I know, I am. Prig, was it? It's a great burden to have such a charitable nature, but I... She broke off as she noticed Calico lounging on the fawn's head, watching us all with a self-satisfied smirk on his feline face. But his smirk vanished abruptly as Lady Eunice grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. He yowled and squirmed, but to no avail. Oh, what a pretty kitty, Lady Eunice crooned. How'd you like a silk collar with a row of tiny silver bells? I had to turn away so Calico wouldn't see my own smirk. Perhaps it would be amusing to have him stick around for Ember's happy ending, after all. The old king could hardly contain his indignation. It was a foul day when the sovereign ruler of Lindenburg was reduced to skittering about his own castle like a frightened mouse. But the king swallowed his humiliation, trying not to fidget as he crouched behind the holly bushes bordering the castle's front entrance. He'd given his newest king sitter the slip barely half an hour ago, but already that officious little oaf Captain Merritt had the royal guard combing the grounds for him. He couldn't allow them to find him yet, not when Liam's coach was due at any moment, not when the spider was late. The king nervously rubbed the signet ring on his left index finger. Fate had given him this single chance to warn his son. Neither quill nor tongue would speak for him, but violence needed no language. Surely, Liam would remember what breaking the golden ram seal on the ring meant. Only a Bonaventure would know that. But would he even recognize Liam? It was almost a relief when the court had shipped his son off to study in Holtenburg so that he didn't have to watch the hurt in Liam's eyes slowly turn to shame and worse, scorn. Now the king could hardly remember the gangly boy who used to careen through the corridors, knocking down marble busts and slipping frogs in nobles' pockets. The king tensed as an ebony coach drawn by four bay horses rumbled up to the steps. The coach door swung open, and a rather shabbily dressed young man clambered out and sneezed violently three times in rapid succession. Though the young man had the aquiline nose and fair weather blue eyes of a Bonaventure, he slouched and kept his gaze downcast in a manner more befitting a peasant than the crown prince of Lindenburg. And were those spectacles on his face? 
No matter. This vagabond boy was his flesh and blood. Red berries scattered as the king sprang from the holly bush and seized Liam by the collar. Pain lanced through the king's arm as he brought his free hand up and slammed his fist against the coach's paneling. The ram seal cracked neatly in half and fell from the ring. He brought his bloodied knuckles up to Liam's face and willed his son to read the ring's message. Treachery. No Bonaventure ever broke the seal unless betrayed by an ally close to court. But Liam trampled the shattered seal under his foot as he struggled against his grip. Get off me, he gasped, his spectacles falling to the ground. The king fell to his knees, dragging his son with him. Tears slipped freely down his face, but the last shreds of his pride had left him years ago. Liam must be made to remember, but how? Hello, father, a cheery voice called out. Startled, the king glanced up as a second young man emerged from the coach, twirling a monocle encrusted in pink sapphires around his finger in a flashing arc. Come now, he chided, let my poor cousin go before he turns blue as a jay. I dragged Lancelot away from his precious herb lord at the Scalarium for a holiday, not a hanging. Utter bewilderment filled the king as his gaze flipped between the two youths. Both bore an uncanny resemblance to his son, but this second version was attired in a ridiculous scarlet jacket, frothing with a fountain of lace at the cuffs. I see you're addled as ever, this new Liam said, cocking his head. Oh well, it can't be helped, I suppose. The king couldn't decide what was worse, that he'd given the ring's message to the wrong man, or that this lacy peacock was his heir. He was so horrified by both truths that he let Captain Merritt pull him off the shabby Lancelot fellow without a struggle. A mistake. The spider glided to Liam's side with the sinuous swiftness of a shadow attaching to its owner. The king panicked and slipped into babbling. Go back to Holtenborg. You will never be safe here, he willed his lips to speak. But as usual, his vile tongue wrenched the words away from him. There are asps in the asphodel, he shouted. Never trust in thimbles, lad. Liam stifled a yawn. Does my father commonly rave about thimbles? On his better days, the spider said gravely. But the king caught the barest glint of teeth, betraying a smile. No doubt the spider relished his treachery. Like a fine draught that only grew sweeter with age, and now with youth. Rage coursed through the king's veins as he broke free of Captain Merritt's grip and lunged at the spider. Guards, sw guards swarmed the king, drawing him back. Fools, did they think he meant to strike the crimson dandy cowering behind the spider's thin silhouette? For Prince William's safety, I shall have his majesty confined to his bedchambers immediately, Captain Merritt huffed, mopping perspiration from his brow. A wise precaution, the spider said. His voice slid into a velvet whisper as he turned to Liam. My prince, I would advise you to stay away from your father. I am afraid your presence will only further agitate him. Yes, yes, whatever you feel is best, Liam interrupted, seeming to recover his spirits as his gaze wandered past the spider to a serving girl carrying a tray of goblets. He snapped his fingers. You there, comely wench. He brushed past the spider and draped his arm across the girl's shoulder. I'm parched to the bone. Would you kindly lead me to the wine cellars? I'd like to become reacquainted with my kingdom. Liam slapped his cousin on the back as he passed him, causing the young man to drop the spectacles he was scrubbing. Make sure the servants don't jostle my trunks, will you, Lance? It would be an epic catastrophe if my Elamere cravats were crushed before I presented them at court. Tragic, Lance muttered as he picked up his bent spectacles. Liam disappeared into the castle with the giggling serving girl in tow, but the king didn't even bother trying to twist his syllables against the spell. There was nothing left to say. If this frilly fop was indeed his son, then Lindenberg was already lost. Thank you for listening, my baronets of bumpkinry. Until next week, tira lira. <laughs>